The Parasect race in Pokemon Yellow that took place about 13 or 14 months ago is almost a myth or a legend on my channel at this point, but guys, it's finally here. But really quick, before we start dissecting this little bug, there are two things that I want to gloss over real quick about the original footage. The first is that it was recorded on an old potato computer that would overheat if I looked at it wrong, and the second is that it's been so long that things like the in-the-moment emotions or the finer details, they're just kind of lost to the sands of time. Now to remedy this, I have recreated the route. I have new footage for today's video. Now this not only let me relive the PTSD that I suffered throughout the race, but it let me refresh myself so I could articulate the run better for you guys. This new footage is under my rule set, so if you want to know more about that, check out the description. And if you want to know even more, there's also an unlisted video you can check out down there. But we're still going to be flipping over to that original race footage when it's relevant. I also do solo run content often, so whether you are a new viewer or a returning subscriber like Blake Schwab, I really do appreciate the continued support. And we're going to start out today by talking about naming your character in Pokemon. Very exciting stuff. Stuff. Keep in mind that the only metric for this race is time. It's the only thing that matters for your placement. And since we are using a vanilla ROM, the archaic and single scrolling text is a factor. The easiest and most simple way to save time is to name yourself and your Pokemon short or even a single character name. And for example, I named my Parasect PP because I have the mind of a 10 year old and I just, I can't help but chuckle when I see it. And I bring this up because some people name their Pokemon full length names for the sake of maybe some brand recognition or maybe being more noticeable in the main video. And remember that a lot of us restarted this run hundreds of times and from the bottom of my heart I can just I, I can genuinely appreciate the hustle and the kind of mindset that you would have to have to sacrifice time The only thing that matters just to be slightly more noticeable. It's kind of wild to me Maybe I'm alone in that. Let me know as for the starting rival The only thing you need to know here is that Flareon is the head and shoulders best team to face in this run So winning here skipping the optional rival in Viridian is the strategy today I'm pretty sure everyone came to that consensus as well now let's talk about the main character a little bit and they're gonna be three things that define Parasect and the first two are straight up red flags. The first is it's atrocious 30 base speed. Speed is king in solo runs and when you are tied with notable Pokemon like Snorlax and Slowbro, you already know it's gonna be an uphill battle. Slowbro is my favorite Pokemon but 30 base speed, it's just, it's not what you wanna see. Second is that Parasect has not one, not two, but three juicy double weaknesses. Poison, it's very common in the early game and we're gonna see it the most. Flying is gonna be something that's a little bit more rare in Gen 1, but there is one fight that I really don't want to think about right now, and Fire, it only comes into play near the end of the run for basically a single battle, but you have a really long time to prepare for it. The third and final thing is Parasect's signature move, it's Spore. It's a 100% accurate sleep-inducing move, and for my money, I think sleep is the most busted thing in Gen 1, so by extension, I do think that Spore is the most broken move in the game, and there's a reason why only two extremely slow Pokemon get access to it. This move is going to be the crux of the entire run. Everything is going to revolve around it when we finally get access to it later in the game. And now I think we can start maybe diving into the details of the run. But before we do, make sure you're sitting back, make sure you're relaxed, grab yourself a soda pop, strap in because this one's going to be a long one today. The thing about this Parasect race was that we had a massive five weeks to complete it. And I would say within a week or two runs and various routes that were already kind of already optimized, but the extended time and the overall human nature of being competitive, it led to more and more refinement. This meant that corners started to get cut a lot and more luck based strategies emerged. And while I like to do more consistent runs, you had to pretty much evolve with the meta of the race or you would just kind of be left behind. This is going to be relevant and it's really frustrating here because because the early game of Parasect is where pretty much all the corners were cut and I really can't stress enough how awful this felt. I'd estimate that I restarted this race hundreds if not thousands of times so I could kind of keep up with the luck based strategies and get the best time I could. First and foremost let's talk about encounters. This was a huge factor in restarts and it begins right here in Viridian Forest. In the submitted footage I only had five encounters total including the Pidgey and that's really good but unfortunately that's only like 10% of the luck required for this early game. Outside of that, I did make a slight change. I don't know this for sure, but I think most other routes battled every single trainer here, but I cut out the second optional bug catcher. In my opinion, fighting early Metapods with Scratch while they just sit there and use Harden is a really slow battle, and this trainer has two of them on top of that. And I supplemented that by getting about 80 extra experience for wild Pokemon. The 80 experience is relevant here when looking at the Lightyear's Junior Trainer. The Diglett, it's, it's whatever. I guess it could crit, but that extra experience will push 
push you up to level 10 when you go into the sand shrew the extra stats along with that damage rounding makes this one feel pretty solid and it eliminates this battle as a reset point whereas coming here at level 9 feels questionable at best with how many reset points are in this early game how much are coming up it's it just felt best to avoid having any more problems now we do get a little bit low but we picked up some potions i can heal up and that means that it's time to face brock In Pokemon Yellow, Geodude is a lower level and it doesn't have Defense Curl like it does in Pokemon Red and Blue and that means Leech Live does a pretty great job here. You can heal back some of that tackle damage and this part's pretty straightforward, now we can just talk about Onyx. There are some janky Gen 1 shenanigans at play here to take note of. The first is that if you are paralyzed in Gen 1 and you use something like Rest, or in this case Brock uses a full heal, the cut speed isn't going to be fixed, it's still going to be lowered. This means you can use Stun Spore and despite that very bad 30 base speed, we do out speed onyx now for the rest of the battle the second thing is that there's a interaction with the healing effect of leech life and bide and it makes it do less damage overall now these two things add up to make this one fairly consistent but it can be a little bit slow in the race footage i wrapped up this battle at about five minutes even which is about 15 seconds slower than my fastest attempt but we've talked about the luck based strategies a good bit already and for this race you generally want to play out the first 10 or 15 minutes of the early game because 15 seconds is pretty easy to make up later Coming up, there's another part of this race that made it really interesting to me. The way things played out meant that Parasect's Elite Four was not found at the end of the game, my friends. Instead, we have four trainers kind of sprinkled throughout this early game here that I like to call the Elite Four for this race. And first up is the I Like Shorts youngster. And for the first time in history, he's going to get an intro today. First up is Rattata, and it's really not that big of a deal. It could do some solid damage, but it could also badge boost you with like a tail whip, and it's really not the thing you were worried about for this battle. Let's move on. We can enter the Ekans, and all you can do here is let Jesus take the wheel. It outspeeds you, it has double super effective poison damage, and it has Gen 1 wrap. If the AI wants to, it can just decide that you don't get to play the game today, and it's going to whittle you down with wrap, and it's going to do that into a poison sting, and you're not going to have any input. You're not going to get to take a single turn. Now this one was really frustrating, it felt really bad, but the silver lining here is that he does have random AI and you can see how simple it looks here when things just kind of go right, but this trainer caused many a reset collectively for the race and it's definitely worth the highlight. It was definitely one of the more frustrating early parts. This seems like as good of a spot as any to talk about maybe why I entered the race or what was my motivation. And outside of like friendly competition and community interaction, it really came down to like recognition and testing my skills. I've been playing Gen 1 Pokemon as a hobby for years and my channel, it's extremely small in the grand scheme of the YouTube world. And just getting a chance to showcase your skills for a channel as big as Scott seemed like an opportunity that I really couldn't pass up. And while nothing may come of it, you do miss 100% of the shots you don't take like the great Michael Scott once said and throughout the whole process i actually got to meet a bunch of people i even got to stream with scott one time it was really cool and the future might even hold more exciting things you never know and if someone out there that otherwise maybe wouldn't have ever found my channel finds some enjoyment shares the love for solo running and just likes playing pokemon then that's kind of what it's all about to get that connection and that interaction it was also about validation to some extent now just from my own community i wanted you guys to know that even though my rule set isn't the typical scott's thoughts patented rules that you see on a lot of channels that my routing my planning optimization it's just up there with anyone else and i guess i wanted to put it to the test but let's keep things moving along Mount Moon, it was more important than Viridian Forest in terms of encounters. Now part of the massive amount of resets here was fishing for a decently low number of encounters here. And for my submission, I got one of the best Mount Moon visits I've ever had, ever seen. It was a mere five encounters, and that's extremely godlike, but you really have to keep in mind that it took me about a thousand attempts to get a start this perfect. And at the end of the day, you can thank the five weeks of racing for allowing something like this to even be possible at all. And I would say getting like eight or nine encounters here would be a more realistic expectation, but if you had like 25 encounters on Mount Moon like I did a few weeks ago for a video I was filming, uh, you might as well just reset. As for experience, I do pick up the Double Grass Lass. Her Pokemon are double weak to Leech Life being Grass and Poison type. And just like in the forest, I am going to opt to pick up Wild Encounter experience. So I battle a few Zubats. I get about 130 experience before I proceed further. And at the end, after the Super Nerd, the second member of Parasect's Elite Four awaits us in the form of Jesse and James.
Just like with the comfy shorts youngster, we have an Ekans problem once again, and it's worth pointing out that there is a much more consistent route where you outspeed this snaky boy, and things are much easier, but we've been over why the race forced me to do what we have to do, so let's just embrace the luck strats together. Overall, it's not really as bad as the first Ekans, but look at that poison sting damage I had to take before we can move on in the fight. Meowth is next, and let's just say that it can be annoying. Now, outside of doing good damage, if you maybe get leered earlier on the Ekans, Growl is going to be the killer for this part. With another poison top just waiting in the back the attack debuff makes things much harder especially when you look at pp's power points here in my recreation footage specifically you can see that i have just enough leech lamps to finish off the comping and it would be a 100 reset if we got growled so i was cutting it close when i recreated the run coughing can also do double super effective damage to kind of put a cherry on top of this fight but thankfully this rocket battle doesn't have good ai we make it through another unnecessarily tough fight in the name of speed at this point, you can almost see the light at the end of the tunnel for what was Paris X Gauntlet, and we can kind of jump back to the race footage real quick. You can see that I'm leaving Mount Moon at 8 minutes and 40 seconds-ish, and this blew all my other attempts out of the water. I was extremely excited, but I was cautious at this point because I've kind of relived this moment too many times to count. I did have maybe one or two other great runs that ended in tragedy, but let me emphasize one more time that this is the result of a ton of resets just fishing for really good results, and you guys are watching my absolute best run, but I really want you to visualize the mountain of failures that needed to happen before we got to this point. And it might surprise you to hear me say how nervous I was at this point. To be in Cerulean sub nine minutes was a rare feat, and I'll go into more detail about the entirety of the early game when we kind of wrap it up, but if you've been paying attention, we've only seen two of Parasex Elite 4, and the third one, it's fast approaching. We've cut corners, so we do need that quick level boost from Misty because she's free, but ladies and gentlemen, Let's, we gotta have a chat about the Golding Jr. Trainer right before Misty. This was the hardest battle in the entire run, and it's where I make my first save. Now generally, when I was fishing for these great times, I just wouldn't save at all, and I would just restart if I had any resets. But at the time, my pace was so good that I was willing to actually take a reset here if it happens. But we can just dive in, we can talk about this one. This is the part of the game, pretty much the only part of the game where the double weakness to flying comes into play. Peck will absolutely murder you, and the only other moves Golding has is Tail Whip, which is going to make Peck hit harder, and Supersonic, which the computer can just turn on the cheats, make it automatically hit, and make you miss your turns. Now just pay attention here to the disgusting damage that this little fish does here. I can't speak for everyone, but this battle, it had to have caused the most resets in the entire race. Now keep in mind, I'm doing this at a little bit of a lower level than some other runs, but to my surprise, I actually get passed on the first attempt in the redo. If you don't know, I do two or three playthroughs of a Pokemon when I'm doing my personal runs, and it made me kind of wonder if maybe I was just a lot worse back then, or maybe if I was just in my mind, I was embellishing the difficulty of the race, but I didn't really want to think about that. Let's not think about that, and let's kind of flip over to the original footage. At this time, I hate to admit it, but negativity kind of creeped into my brain. I started going for Stun Spore thinking that, hey, if it skips a turn, I'd have a better chance, and it just simply doesn't work out in the first attempt here, and I do have the first reset, but like I said earlier, Earlier, my time was really good and I knew that it was kind of worth taking a reset and playing out the run so I don't panic we reset we hop right back into the fight and I'm gonna use the same strat as last time I still take a peck it does a lot of damage but a little luck with an eventual fully paralyzed turn skip it lets me outpace the Goldeen and we get this one down and we'll return with some thoughts about the early game as a whole but Misty's up next and like I said earlier she's a free fight and there's really not much she can do pretty much the combination of leech life being super effective on Starmie and Parasect resist water moves is all you really need to know. We don't really have to dwell too much on it here, but the way I set up my experience means that I do level up exactly to level 19 after the star me, and when I get out of the fight, I do use a single rare candy to get me up to level 20, and now, my friends, it's time to finish up this early game by facing the final member of Parasex Elite 4. Spiro is first and a growl is devastating. You don't outspeed and it's just kind of up to luck here which is really fitting for this run. The silver lining is that level 20 and the damage rounding threshold put this at a pretty comfortable two shot range. And here and in the original footage I don't get growled on either one we can move on. Sancho is next and one of the lessons I learned from doing this run so much and participating in the race was to not really fear sand attack that much. If you look at the glass half full it actually badge boosts our attack and I've learned just to kind of push through the sand 
command rather than treat it like a death sentence. In this run footage that you're going to see here, I do miss a couple of times here and there, but it's really not that big of a deal. But in the original footage, I don't it doesn't phase me at all. I just don't even miss, so it's pretty good. Now, like most runs, this fight is very front loaded. We do make it through, and for all intents and purposes, the Elite Four for Parasect is over, and this is where you can kind of sit back and just breathe a sigh of relief. Now the pace of the video is about to pick up and we can kind of go over why. I can't speak for everyone else, but the decision to cut corners and trim down the early game as much as you can ultimately came down to efficiency. From this point on, the run is pretty consistent and it was what I was most comfortable with and what I practiced the most. And the idea is that at most, you're only going to waste five to 10 minutes on a busted attempt in the early game, whereas you could end up wasting anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes if you kind of route it inconsistently later in the game. It just kind of goes without saying that it's much less devastating to lose on an early ek in six minutes into the game rather than it is to reset on something really deep into the run. Now keep in mind that there is a much more consistent way to do this run and it's kind of sad that it's just not good enough. I'd say the consistent route where you outspeed the ekens and have a little bit of a higher chance on things like Goldeen and Rival Number 2 has a cap of about 47 minutes and it's just simply not good enough to get up in the ranks which led to a lot of frustration and it felt bad because it's kind of antithetical to how I normally do runs but like I said earlier, other people's routes kind of led to what we will ultimately see in Scott's video in my run. I think we could get together like a race podcast and we could probably talk for hours and debate whether the five week time span and the injection of luck based strategies is actually in the spirit of what a solo run actually is, but we're not going to do that today. Now you can go to Scott's video, you can tell him to do a podcast with me if you want to see that. And I actually, I sat down and I thought about what I'm going to say in this video for a really long time and, and trust me when I say that it changed like 30 times. There were some aspects of the race that I really didn't like and maybe there was a little bit of drama here and there behind the scenes, but ultimately I decided to just leave that in the past. There's no reason for me to sit on a soapbox, sip the tea about this when it's all over, and a video is not going to be the place for something like that. Now, like I said earlier, positive vibes is the way to go, but I hope I did a good job of highlighting the pseudo elite board for Parasect, and I kind of gave you a good picture of how Parasect is ultimately defined by its inconsistent and luck based early game at the end of the day but that's past us i think we can start to move on to greener pastures next up we're going to rapidly get two important moves that don't really need an introduction picking up all-star moves like dig while leaving cerulean and body slam when we're down on the ss and it gives parasec some really formidable moves and it's going to make the transition to that mid and late game smooth and real quick i'm going to highlight the gentleman that guards the rare candy i went through tons of routing changes throughout the whole process of the race and when i first started grinding this route i didn't really think about being level level 24 here because I was level 25 on a previous iteration of the route. This perfectly meant that Body Slam could not one shot the Ponyta and with Murphy's Law in full effect, it lived, it used Ember, it burned me and I had a reset. Now think back to how rough that early game was and picture me bright eyed and bushy tailed having a resetless run with a similar time only to be knocked out here where things are ultimately supposed to be consistent from here on out. Now believe me when I say I almost just gave up on the spot right then and there. As for rival number three, it's kind of a night and day difference with some extra levels and some new moves. Now here in my footage, I don't respect the Sparrow. I don't even heal going into the fight. And honestly, I forgot that I had Peck. It does crazy damage. It kind of gave me Goldeen flashbacks, but I do survive and we finish strong. There's no more hassle outside of that. Now I'm going to highlight Surge here. And this fight can be pretty scary despite our dad J Rose clowning on him in every video. In yellow, he does have random AI and it has a one in five crit chance. With things like Mega Punch or Mega Kick, it can just utterly destroy you. If you maybe get a little lazy or cocky and you just don't heal up before the fight. And I'm definitely not bringing this up because it's happened to me before, but I'm, I'm just saying Surge has the ability to be the most free fight in the world, or it could just turn one mega kick crit your head off. That's hard to say, mega kick crit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get a little technical. I don't think anyone is going to argue that Pokemon is a very skill based game. No one is going to compare Pokemon Yellow to mechanical skill levels of like a Dark Souls soul level one no hit run or being top 50 in the world at StarCraft. To me, Pokemon is almost like a game of Sudoku where you're just kind of fitting the puzzle pieces together. It's almost like a mathematical equation. Now, overall, there's very little mechanical skill in the game outside of one thing, and that's going to be the bike that we just picked up. We played this race on times four speed, and movement with the bike is definitely a time save, but it really depends on how good the individual 
is at it. Now this is something I personally practiced, I timed, I calculated, and I spent a lot of time looking through this. And overall, I just think it's kind of an interesting point to bring up. It would probably be better suited for some side video or like a podcast, but the only real thought I have about it here is that I find it really kind of crazy that there are lots of people that just never use the bike. Now there are some parts of the game where I don't think it really saves time, but to just ignore this thing entirely just seems a little bit short-sighted, especially if you care enough about playing Pokemon to where you're going to enter a five week long race, do hundreds of runs to try to win. But I did want to bring it up, touch on it just a little bit. And I guess talking about it when you actually pick up the bike seems like the best fit for it in a video. Moving into Rock Tunnel, we can talk about my first blunder. There's more than one guys, I'm sad to say. I accidentally run into a trainer here and I've talked about the amount of time needed to get even one solid run. And on the inside, when I ran into this trainer, I was about ready to internally scream just because of how careless I was. I couldn't believe I made this mistake. Now this is a good opportunity to talk about people who follow a script and they just take that straight line approach to their game and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you do that and something like this happens that's off script, your entire run is derailed and you really can't recover. And I think the mark of a good speed runner and I think a good trait for life in general is kind of like the adaptability and the ability to keep your cool rather than panic and just kind of accept my fate that this is a lost run. I was already kind of thinking ahead to later trainers that I could just cut out on the fly to maybe minimize the loss here. As much as I would just love to beat my chest and show you guys just flawless gameplay of like top tier Parasect, I think it's very important to know that I still made several mistakes in this run. But after that, it is time for Celadon. And now there's kind of another bike type situation here I'm going to talk about briefly. Under Scott's rules, you can use the Pokey Daw on the Ghost Marowak to skip the Rocket Hideout. Now I personally, I don't do that for my other runs. We don't need to go into it. But you do have to do it in this race because it's just much faster. And what I want to highlight is that I still go into the Rocket Hideout to pick up the Rare Candy. Now this doesn't seem like too big of a deal, but there's another route that I feel like 15 other people did. They just didn't bother to get this candy and instead opted to do like four or five optional battles instead. Now let me lay it down for you guys. Let me say that from the time you leave the center, you go to the hideout, you do the one grunt battle, you pick up the candy, you dig out, it only costs you approximately 28 seconds. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of confusing that someone would think that doing that many battles is actually faster than this. And the overall message to maybe someone who wants to learn something here is that if you're skipping rare candies, but you're still doing optional battles, and I think you probably need to reevaluate the thought process that's just a little bit. That's just my opinion. Maybe some people just didn't know how quick it is to actually grab, but it was another aspect of the run that I found interested and I wanted just to dive in, touch on it just for a second. Next up, we're heading to Erica, and the goal here, we're going to be battling two or three trainers, but this is a, a very important moment. We get our first piece of Exodia in the form of Spore. Now, I've already touched on it at the beginning, but to emphasize this once again, I think this is the strongest move in Gen 1. It's exclusive to Parasac, and it goes without saying how important this is to the overall overall success of the run. Outside of that, you're going to see me battle the Execute Beauty here in the recreated footage. And this was actually the battle in the race that I cut out on the fly just to try to make up some time for that original blunder. But with that out of the way, I think we can just kind of take a look at Erica. There's only like a few fights left in the game that are not 100% consistent and this is one of them. I'm kind of uh, shedding a tear right now because I'm remembering an old attempt that was even faster than this where I actually failed on this fight. Now as for the fight itself, you guys know how I feel about Tangela. I think it's awful, it's garbage, and we have Spore. But there is a set of circumstances, a very specific set of circumstances that can cause you to lose this fight. And it starts if you get like a constrict speed drop, which hey look, it happens right here in the footage. On Weeping Bell, you do have to tank an acid because because it outspeeds you, and then you're just gonna use Spore, you can heal up, but there are two ways to reset. First is if it crits, you die. The second is if it gets a, a acid defense drop, and oh wow, look guys, it gets an acid defense drop right here. These two things add up, and they're so detrimental because the speed drop, number one, the speed drop means that the gloom is gonna go first, and the defense drop means that the double super effective damage is now something that's going to uh, knock the mushroom straight off your dome, bud. And you would think that th maybe this is a rare occasion, but I've seen this a lot, and with the theme of this run sometimes you get lucky sometimes the computer sets up the perfect sequence of stat drops to give you an unavoidable death on the next attempt the ai it doesn't get those stat drops and i'm able to do the fight correctly i'm able to tank the acid utilize spore heal up a little bit and then just ultimately whittle down her pokemon's hp but i would like to hammer home the point that spore is the most busted move in the game and it goes doubly so if you start to outspeed your opponents and keep that in mind because we're going to start seeing that a lot in the near future and it's going to be a key to this run
Let's quickly gloss over our Celadon buy, and there's the usual things like buying Super Repels, picking up a couple of Poke Dolls for the Marabak Skip, and Future Mimic, and I'd like to talk about the top 4 TMs. I cut them out because a lot of times I feel like they're a little bit slow, and I kind of expand upon that in normal videos. Now, I think you could squeak out an extra vitamin here, but I do skip it just to save some time, and this means that I can just buy 3 Carbos to help out our pathetic speed. Now, this was a mistake. It was another one of my blunders. It really bites me later, and we'll cover that when we make it there, but to remain faithful to the original run, I I did buy three here as well so I can give you guys the full rundown. And we could just go straight into Pokemon Tower and there's only one thing to note about Rival number four and that's Firo. Now it's only going to go for Mirror Move so you need to use Spore. The chance for it to use Mirror Move on your Body Slam and then have it paralyze you and make this part of the game uncomfortable is a lot higher than you would actually think. Kind of like with the Erica situation. So this is an instance where you really want to go for the safe strats. This route also led me to not be able to outspeed the Gastly's. Now this could be a potential annoying situation but I, I don't really have problems here it never really was an issue and the last thing here is uh, Jesse and James I never really had problems here either but if let's say Arbok uses something like glare and then maybe the wheezing starts to hit some double super effective damage then you could be in trouble but you do have spore but you just kind of got to pay attention but that's about all there is to say about Pokemon Tower let's uh, go to the next part down in the Safari Zone I am picking up things like the Carbos and the final HMs of the run I do skip the protein here just to save a few seconds here and there and it'll also save you another instance of menuing and if you are a regular viewer you know that I talk about full restores a lot and fun fact this is actually where I kind of developed that strategy to elaborate you can pick up up to three full restores on the standard path throughout the game and if you have a decent enough run a good enough Pokemon you can just hold them until the end of the game and you can avoid buying right before you go into the elite four so it's just another little time save now we're gonna be getting into the biggest divergence between the Parasect runs to get Swords Dance or to not get Swords Dance that was the question but I really Really liked how this made the route feel and we're going to sylph and we're going to be doing what i like to call a half sylph i'm doing essentially everything but battling rival number five because honestly it's just too inconsistent for my blood and i know it's that's a pretty funny thing to say considering how the game started but i do the usual things like the 10th floor goodies i grab the card key and then we can make our way to the seventh floor to get that sweet glorious juicy swords dance and this really has nothing to do with that but i was obsessed with menuing in this run combining different actions into one menu, organizing my bag slots, keeping track of when to use an item, how many items I have. They were all skills I really honed in this race and it was just really satisfying when it all came together. I also used four rare candies here to get up to level 38 and they were really crucial for the run and we'll talk about that in a minute. First I'd like to talk about the different learn sets and the drawback to my route specifically. Obviously having to halfway do sylph, leave, and then backtrack later it's a time loss and it made me, honestly guys, it made me worried about the viability of this run. It almost made me waver but I'm I'm going to talk about where this run actually makes up a little bit of that time. In my last video, I touched on what I would like to call now turn economy. In the first juggler in Koga's Gym, we can kind of illustrate that point. If you didn't have Swords Dance, the Drowsies are going to be a two turn knockout. This means you're going to take a turn, they take a turn, and then you take another turn. You're going to rinse and repeat this multiple times, and the Kadabra's going to outspeed you and it's going to go first. Using a single Swords Dance, it puts the turn economy into the situation where you set up one time, and then you can one shot all the Drowsies, and it does save a few turns. That might not really seem like a lot, but remember that we're only going to be utilizing Swords Dance for about seven battles, and it not only makes those battles faster, each and every one of them, but it also makes them more consistent. And we're about to go into Koga, and this is where it's going to help the most, but consistency is the key. And I think there were some other routes that actually had to save before Koga and rely on a little bit of luck and essentially hope, but with this route, I don't even have to save before Koga because outside of like a Gen 1 miss, there's really no way to lose this fight. And I'm highlighting this fight simply due to how pivotal it was during the routing process. It was kind of the point in the game that gave a lot of trouble and you kind of had to build around this point. Now earlier I used those candies and it was specifically to outspeed the first bin on that. Now remember guys, Spore is absolutely busted when you outspeed. So we're going to be putting this thing to sleep and we're going to be getting to a plus six attack with Swords Dance. This means we now have the damage to one shot the rest of his team. And even if something like we get toxic put on us like happens here, it doesn't even matter that we only speed tie the second men on that. It doesn't matter that we're outsped for the last two Pokemon because that free setup and all this planning led to a 100% consistent Koga fight and it felt really satisfying. Winning against Koga gives us the coveted second piece of Exodia and it's the speed badge boost. With very low speed, 
a 12.5% increase is welcome, but more importantly, the badge boost glitch with Swords Dance giving us a three additional 12.5% boost means that we can just we can just go ahead and jump straight into rival number five. And here's how this one goes. I do need one badge boost, but our experience is sort of set up here to level up after the Sand Slash. So I take a Poison Sting, take a little bit of damage, I put it to sleep, and I set up two of the three Sword Stance before taking it out because I know the speed badge boosts are gonna go away after this. Now Cloyster is next. It does have super effective damage, but the levels and the carbos, it lets us naturally outspeed. And since we, we've been over this, guys, we have Spore. This lets us comfortably and freely set up one more Sword Stance for that speed badge boost. And from that point, we're pretty much set up for the sweep. This extra bit of speed lets us outspeed the rest of the team outside of the Kadabra, and that's not really a, that big of a deal. In red and blue, it would be an Alakazam already. Maybe it would be more trouble, but this one's a done deal. And you can see that doing things in the order that I'm doing them in is making this part of the game pretty consistent. Let's skip the rest of Sylph, and after picking up Mimic, we can hop straight into Sabrina, and there's really no need for introductions here. The main thing about this fight is that it's ultimately decided really early. Abra exists for only one reason, and that's to put Flash on you. And just like earlier with the second rival fight, I just, I really don't care. I'm going to take the flash and stride and I'm just going to brute force my way through this fight because Parasect, he's a real man's man. When that's over with, there are several things that I do at once. Now, I'm going to be using my candies. I'm going to get up to level 46. There is this little annoying little Raticate found in Pokemon Mansion. It really just wants to sink its fangs into you. It's, it's, I hate it. And this is anecdotal, but it's level 46. So technically you could still encounter it through the repel, but doing it this way, I never personally encountered it I, I can't even think of a single time but take that with a grain of salt because it has been quite a long time I also go ahead and learn mega drain here and that's just so we can combine some menuing like I talked about earlier and now it's time for a pretty quick swim down to Cinnabar it's it's not gonna be brisk this week because we're kind of on the clock and inside of Pokemon Mansion you get the final carbos very important but what's even more important are these final two rare candies you go ahead and use them and you can pick up the third and final piece of Exodia and we can ascend to deity status at level 48 you learn growth the special boost it's really not that important the key thing here is that you can use it an additional three times over swords dance and six total badge boost with 30 base speed is crucial and it kind of sets a clear goal from now until the end of the game the run starts to become this little mini game where you're just kind of learning how many growths you need to outspeed while managing your experience so that you don't level up mid fight to lose those boosts and it's going to enable spore to reach its full potential and before we hop into the next battle I had to stop for a second. I had to quickly contemplate the age-old question. I just, I didn't know what TM28 was. Was it Tombstoner, brother? Or not? It's hard to tell sometimes, but we couldn't, we couldn't stop and think too much because it was a speed run. But I think it's time for Blaine now. He's buffed up in the yellow version. He's much stronger and we do have that double weakness to fire. So let's see what happens. Ninetales is up first, and this is a battle you have to kind of keep your thumb over the reset key because if it uses a turn one flamethrower, it's over. There's nothing you can do about it. Thankfully, Blaine doesn't have good AI. So if it gives you a chance to actually connect with a Spore, the ultimate goal is to set up five growths, and this will let you outspeed his whole team. I do accidentally set up an extra growth here, but it really doesn't matter. At this point, you don't even need Spore. You can just use Dig to go on the sweep, but I want you to look at this Arcanine moment here. It does set up Reflect while I'm underground. That lets it survive, but with growth set up, I want you guys to take a peek at our little PP Parasect tanking this flamethrower like a true champion, and that's the battle over just like that. But I do want to flip back over to the original footage real quick, and I want to highlight this part because it wasn't really a blunder on my part but I get some extreme bad luck on the nine tails this one takes me roughly 30 seconds to wrangle it in get set up and do what I need to do and this combined with that extra encounter from earlier it really had me worried about this run but on the bright side we only have one gym left and I was under 36 minutes Let's keep it moving straight into Giovanni and, and some of you might say, what about Ride on Rock Slide? And to that I have to say, haven't you been paying attention at all, you fool? Here the battle is it's ultimately decided on the first turn, kind of like with Blaine. Since it outspeeds, Doug Trio can go for Fisher or even like a sand attack. But here we get we get blessed. We get a patented guard spec by Silphco. And that means I can just set up and I can go for that easy sweep. Now in my footage here that you're watching, I do fumble my moves a little bit. It's a little bit slower, but in the original race footage, it was much cleaner but the result and it's the same at the end 
Hopping directly into rival number six, the main thing you need to know is that I naturally outspeed Sand Slash. This means Spore can do its thing, but for now one growth into a Mega Drain is all we need because we are going to level up directly after. Execute is next and we can just simply Spore it, set up the required growth and, and that's a done deal. But in my footage, I don't know, I guess I got a little impatient. I actually end up getting poisoned and I start wasting a little bit more time than was necessary, but at this point the battle's over. And what you're about to see is pretty much how every fight's going to go from here on out. If you let this little fungi outspeed you, it's already over. Now, Kadabra, it does set up Reflect, it does live one turn, but it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Now my friends, Parasect is on the precipice of victory. We've had a couple of missteps here and there, but we've seen PP's dirty little strategy in action and it feels like it's online now and the only real question left is if it can do the same thing against the game's toughest challenge and finish really strong. Now I do pick up the rare candy in Victory Road and if you've watched my other videos, you know I do like to skip this a lot of times, but when you are as reliant on a badge boost setup, you really need to make sure you pick this so you can reset your experience and you can kind of control when you level up. Outside of that, I do want to touch on full restores real quick. Parasect was in this unique position where it only needed two to sweep the entire Elite Four, and that means you can skip buying here, which does save a little bit of time. And I know I've been mentioning little time saves a lot, and it could get annoying, but I do, I want to pose the question to you guys and honestly ask, how many little time saves does it take before it starts adding up to large chunks of time? And I'm going to leave you with that to answer. I'll let you contemplate on that. And now I guess it's time, all we can do is challenge the Elite Four, but I guess you would probably call this the fake Elite Four, because real ones already know we've already challenged the the true elite four earlier in the game Lorelai's first, and not to be a downer, but this is yet another battle with one of Parasect's 22 weaknesses, but we know the goal by now. We can tank anyone move from the Dugong, we can put it to sleep, and we can set up. Now, I'll play a little bit lazy here in the footage. I actually tank a second Aurora Beam, and at this point I have two attack drops, which makes Dig all but useless, but eight badge boosts gives us more than enough stats to make it through this fight at this point. Mega Drain is just so good here, and there was one route in the race that opted to use Solar Beam instead, and while I do think the healing here is just so valuable it's always interesting to see those different strategies and the only other thing to talk about is I made another mistake here at least in my footage I shouldn't have used dig on the jinx because my attacks lowered but I do crit so I get kind of bailed out I don't get punished for the mistake and I guess that's really all there is to say about Lorelai and that means we can move on to Bruno and as much as we kind of joke around about Bruno I still want to set up here to ensure that I get the ranges and play it a little bit safe I do think it would be completely idiotic to kind of take a trainer lightly this late in the run and it would just kind of wipe all your progress. It's so hard to get, guys. Like, don't take Bruno lightly in this situation. And while this battle is not a series of one-shots, it is pretty comfortable once you set up. It's not really worth going into it any more than that. Just play it safe. Just kind of stick to the game plan. Now let's enter Agatha, and with low speed, it's going to be a roll of the dice, and I'm going to go on record here, I'm going to say that I think yellow version Agatha is actually weaker than her red and blue counterpart due to the lack of hypnosis on the first Gengar, which is the more frustrating part of the fight in my opinion. Agatha does have some unique AI, she's going to swap randomly, and it does make me look a little bit silly here as she swaps a couple of times, but ultimately I do achieve that final goal of using growth to hit the necessary speed breakpoints, and now I really want to highlight and talk about the goal bat for a second. There are two Pokemon Pokemon in this entire run where you just really don't have an answer for them. Ultimately, it's kind of one of the few concessions you have to make towards this end game, and it comes down to sacrificing the Golbat and the eventual Executor matchup in favor of making everything else feel really smooth, and I was fine with that. Now keep in mind that this isn't difficult since you do outspeed and you do have Spore, it's just mind-numbingly slow. The only other thing to say is that in my footage, I do mess up my scuff my experience just a little bit. I actually level up at the end of the fight, I'm not supposed to. This means that I don't outspeed the final Gengar, but it's kind of like a no harm, no foul type situation. I do make it through. Going into Lance, I did learn Mimic over Dig, and I used that final Victory Road Rare Candy. And I think you guys know what the goal is going to be here. Sleep into Spore. At this point, it's a story as old as time itself. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. And I'm going to be setting up the full complement of Gross here for two main reasons. The first is that Mega Drain is just kind of a weak move, and you have to exclusively use it for the first two Pokemon. And the second is to outspeed the Aerodactyl. I, remember, guys, you're double weak to flying, and you'd be kind of foolish to take the risk of like a critical hit fly or something like that. Now, even at maximum setup, 
Gyarados is going to take two Mega Drains to take out. And the first Dragonair that comes in, it's going to take two as well. You also want to put it to sleep just to be a little bit more safe. And if you're familiar with Pokemon Yellow, I think you kind of know where this battle's headed. Lance, he conveniently has a boss weapon laying in his arena in the form of a mimicable Ice Beam on the second Dragonair. And we're going to take it. And you already know with the boost, it's going to trivialize the battle. So we just kind of drop a few Ice Cubes on the remaining Pokemon. And that takes us on to the final battle of the game. Sand Slash is first, and do I even need to say it? If you start out with a growth here, it's gonna let you perma spore the Sand Slash, and guys, this is where I get to actually correct one of my biggest mistakes from the original race, and we'll get to that soon. But first, the correct strategy here that you're gonna see first, and this is gonna go all the way back to the three Carbos by early, is to set up four growths only right here. Then you're eventually gonna mimic Earthquake, and you're gonna move further into the fight, and that's gonna bring us to another concession, and it's the fact that you're not gonna outspeed Alakazam. If you use five growths, on the sand slash it's only going to be a speed tie which is going to pretty much put it at a coin flip and i just kind of found it easier to live with going second here and you can see here it just misses a kinesis i take it out now let's flip back to the race footage and let me I, i'm going to relive a horrific nightmare a memory i've been living with for over a year like i've already mentioned the strats were always evolving and cutting out the top floor tms was something that was kind of a newer addition i developed and to be perfectly transparent i didn't test it enough with four carbos you would outspeed the alakazam by exactly exactly one speed with five grows and I was used to that being the case and I just really didn't foresee the consequences of a speed tie and I, I think you guys know where this is going to be headed. Of all the bad things to happen, of all the places for the worst luck to occur, I not only lose the speed tie here, but it crits on a psychic and it one shots me. Now guys, I, I want you to fully understand that mentally I was one step away from the ledge at this point because I was convinced that this just cost me the entire race. But remember guys, keeping your cool, it's very important. It, and I just kind of jumped right back in, but I really want you to know that with animations on in this fight, this one blunder alone cost me about 40 seconds of time, and I still think it. Tonight, I'm going to think about it when I'm falling asleep. Let's flip back over to that new footage, and we are on the executor. Just like with Golbat, we don't have a great answer, but since you outspeed, Spore is on the menu, and all you can really do is just slowly whittle it down. I feel like, I don't know this for sure, but I feel like Earthquake's animation is a little bit longer than Mega Drain, even though it does a little bit more damage, so I kind of make a compromise and I use a mix of the two. I'm kind of hoping that I get the right mix to avoid a full restore and that's kind of what happens here. After this we do level up our boost resets and having two boosts remaining was something that was really important for the three carbo strat and it was another small mistake I didn't take into account for the race. After the setup I use earthquake and the end is in sight but first we have to get through the cloister. Now if you only had one boost here with the three carbo strat you would be outsped and what I should do here what everybody should do here is spore it to not risk an attack drop or at worst a freeze proc but I'm kind of playing a little bit loose I just go for the YOLO strat it doesn't cost me and finally at the end Flareon comes in it's looking like a deer in the headlights it doesn't know what to do about this super effective earthquake coming its way and just like that the run and ultimately the race has came to an end As for the race, I clock in with a 45 minute and 55 second time. Now since I waited literally until the last minute to make this video, I do know someone actually made a video that had a faster time, but just looking at it real quick, it looked like some shenanigans were going on, it looked like it broke some rules, so I don't know if it's going to count, I can't really say that for sure, and I honestly I don't care, but I can say that I'm finally glad to have this video out and have everything over with. What makes this run specifically so frustrating was that it was so hard to get, it took literally guys a thousand resets to get this run. I'm not going to go into any drama or anything like that. You can ask me about other stuff later, but the champion fight specifically was a brutal time loss, as well as that really long Nine Tails fight with Blaine, the extra rock tunnel battle. All of it added up, but I'm not really one just to sit around and dwell on the shoulda, woulda, couldas, because when this one was over, I was so mentally exhausted, I didn't even want to think about grinding another run. Flipping back over to the recreation, we can set Parasect up on my tier list, and here's going to be kind of like a sneak preview of the new tier cards. Now, don't get too wrapped up in the numbers because I'll explain it in a couple of weeks but the number at the top it's the result of a formula that's going to give you a 0 to 100 grade and a final in-game time of 2 hours 35 minutes it's pretty astonishing
astonishing for a Pokemon like this, but you can see the asterisk there. It's kind of like denoting that it had to use the Pokedom Marowak skip, but we will cover those things later. But I do think it's pretty crazy to think that this Pokemon, outside of the abysmal luck on Erica, almost had one of the very rare perfect runs. Also, it's very likely that I'm going to stream very soon after this video's out. Scott's going to release a, a juicy cross-gen run race pretty much starting right after his video. And before I get into those sweaty optimizations, I would like to do a blind run live for you guys. So check that out. Ask me about that if you want to. Also, if you're new here and you're still listening to my voice, you're a real one. Any returning real ones, just comment that down below. You already know the drill. I really do appreciate the support. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't and give me some feedback on this editing style. I didn't plan on rolling this style out, but the new transitions, the battle intros, the general pacing, some of the musical stuff, they're all a lot of things I've been working on in the back end while I'm letting the backlog of footage come out. And I just wanted to put a little razzle dazzle on this specific video before this becomes the norm. Now overall, I really wanted to streamline this video and make it a lot shorter, but sometimes I just, I can't help myself. But the last thing I'll say is a special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I really do appreciate the support. And if you want the patch files for my cross-gen runs, or if you just want to help me out, sign up, do whatever you want. And this week, I'm not going to do an intro. We're going to try that out. So I guess that's all there is to say. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.